Good afternoon, everyone. I mean, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our live class sections on corporate reporting. So, in case you are online, kindly signify by saying hi and also including the location you are reaching out from. All right, so the objective for today basically is to review some of the past questions there and we also share some of the exam tips. Okay, so this is going to be very fundamental for us and it will also assist us in simplifying our study okay so let's start by reviewing the first past questions that we're going to discuss today which is on may 2018 so the past questions we'll be discussing is may 2018 question number one so i would advise you to kindly bring out your client finders so that we can flow together on okay bring out your client finder to may 2018 and in case you don't have it with you presently never mind just have your pen and jotter i mean pen and jotter so that you can take notes on few Points. Okay, so Akonji uh, Akiyemi, you are welcome online from me, All right, so May 2018 question number one is on common life group, which happens to be a compulsory question. That is, every student are expected to attempt this question number one. It is what compulsory. So the question talks about common life groups, which carries on business as a distributor of warehouse equipment and as a distributor of warehouse equipment and or and warehouse equipment and importer of fruit into the country so all these informations are the basic background of the group structure so let's go through the note to the account so that we can discuss we, let's go through the notes to the account so that we can discuss it one after the other okay so please you need to also click on the share button so that you can have this thing saved on your facebook page so this is very very important click on the share button so that you can have if you can have this thing stored on your facebook page so that you can always repeat it anytime you want to repeat although we're in officer Busaya from abuja you are welcome online so let's so in attempting questions on group account, there are some guiding principles that you need to have. So the first one of them is definitely having a sketch of your solution, which is what I refer to as the skeleton account of the account. So you are going to have the sketch of your solution that is you sketch out your statement of financial position. Okay, you sketch out your statement of profit or loss. Okay, those are the key things that are required in this question. So have your sketch of the solution. So let's assume that you've done your sketch on page one and page two. So we can now go to the page three. Okay, we can go to the page three to start treating the notes to the account one after the other. So precious from Lagos, you are welcome online. All right, so on page one now, the information we have on page one goes thus. Okay, the information we have on page one goes thus. On 1st of January 2012, Komolafe acquired 5.4 ordinary shares in Kelvin for 13.3 million. Okay, Komolafe acquired 5.4 ordinary shares in Kelvin for 13.3 million, at which day there was a credit balance on the retained earnings of Kelvin of 2.8 million. No shares has been issued by no shares has been issued by I mean no share has been issued by Kelvin since the date its shares were acquired by Common Lafe. So that's what we have in the note one. So your takeaway from note one are three things. The first one is to determine the percentage of shareholdings, that is how much how many percent did Common Lafe acquire in Kelvin. So note that Common Lafe acquired 5.4 million and the number of shares we have in Kelvin at one era is six million so that means 5.4 divided by six million that will give us about 90 percent so 90 percent is the holding of common affair in kelvin note that i pick six million because the nominal value of each shares is what is one error but if the nominal value was given as 0 0.5 cobo then the number of ordinary shares that is applicable is going to be 12 million because you divide the value of the shares over by the nominal value to be able to estimate the actual number of what shares okay so that is very very important so please do not forget to share do not forget to share this link on your share button so that we can flow together so a lot of people are joining now we have Said Lawal from Ilon, you are welcome, and Gabriel from Calabar. So, from note one now, 
the three things that are required are first of all the number of shares acquired by common laughing and kelvin which is 90 percent that is 5.4 divided by 6 million that is noted then the second point in note one is the pre-acquisition reserve that is the reserve that exists in the books of the subsidiary as at the date of what acquisition so the reserve of kelvin when it was acquired by Komalafe was given as 2.850 so this is the pre-acquisition reserve so that's the pre-acquisition reserve which exists at the date of the subsidiary which exists at the date of what acquisition then lastly the amount paid by Komalafe to acquire the shares in kelvin is a purchase consideration and the purchase conversion is 13.3 okay that's 13.3 is our purchase conversion so those are the takeaway from note one okay the first takeaway is the percentage of shareholding which is 90 percent and the ncr is 10 percent then the second takeaway is the pre-acquisition reserve and the third takeaway is your purchase consideration which was given as 13.3 Ushe from ABA, you are welcome all right so that's for note one now let's look at the note two now at the date of acquisition okay at the date of what acquisition the fair value of the identifiable net asset of kelvin okay the fair value of identifiable net asset of kelvin kelvin is subsidiary that was acquired by Ushio. the fair value of the identifiable net asset of kelvin was 10 million and the success the excess of the fair value of net asset is due to an increase in the value of non-depreciable land so in this case now this occur at the date of what acquisition that means it's going to affect the net asset acquired so when we are acquiring kelvin it was discovered that the fair value of its asset will have an excess value of what 10 million naira. so this 10 million naira now is going to be debited to our ppe to increase the value of our asset then we will not credit this to ocio because it occurred at acquisition date we'll take it as part of the net asset what acquired in kelvin which will assist us in computing goodwill on acquisition so that's what you do on that note too so in case you have any question please feel free to post it either on the facebook group or on the whatsapp and we'll definitely pick up the questions and respond to it the questions accordingly all right so that's for that so those of you that are online so you are all welcome all right so the third note is talking about acquisition of kelly by kelvin now on 1st january 2014 kelvin acquired 3.2 ordinary shares in kelly kelvin acquired 3.2 ordinary shares in kelly for 7.6 million at which date there was a credit balance on the return any of kelly of 1.9 and no share has been used since acquisition in interest and the fair value of the identifiable net asset of kelly at that date of acquisition approximate their book value so note that komala fair acquired shares in kelly which is 90 percent okay then kelly now acquired shares in i mean kelvin now komala fair acquired 95 percent in kelvin then kelvin now acquired sh shares in what in kelly so the number of shares acquired by kelvin in kelly is 3.2 and the kelly has 4 million shares so that is 3.2 million that will give us 80 percent so kelvin in kelly is what 80 percent so this is what we call indirect group structure indirect what group structure and when you have this kind of group structure the first thing you do is to discongest the group by converting the group structures to fellow okay you convert it to fellow how do you do that now we already know that common laughter had 90 percent in kelly in kelvin now for us to be able to estimate the number of shares that common laughter owns in kelly we just say 90 percent of 80 percent because the investment that common laughter have in kelvin is 90 percent so any investment that kelvin ventures into common laughter is entitled to 90 percent of such investment so we take 90 percent of the um, number of shares owned by kelvin in kelly which is 90 on 80 so that will give us 72 so the, in converting the group to fellow now we now have common laughter in kelvin which is 90 then we also have common laughter in kelly which is what 72 so that is what you do when converting the group structures to fellow so that has been done now then lastly on the purchase consideration remember that kelvin paid 7.6 for the shares it acquired in kelly now so since kelvin paid 7.6 now komala fair is responsible for the contribution of 90 percent of any amount that kelvin pays so 90 percent of 76 will be paid by the komala fair 
that is what Komolafe will use in consolidating the indirect holding of 72 percent in Kelly. Then the balance of 10 percent, since we have Komolafe will pay 90 percent, the balance of 10 percent on the purchase consideration will be contributed by the NCI of Kelvin. So that's what you do in no theory. So we've identified the group structure. So Alex Exomon from Benin City, you are welcome online. Okay, now. So we've taken care of note one to three. Okay, now let's discuss the note four. Note four is talking about intra-group sales. So I said that during 2016, Kelly made intra-group sales to Kelvin, okay, of 900,000, making a profit of 25% on cost and 150,000 of these goods were in inventory at 31st December. So this is basically intra-group trading. Now we are going to discuss this from the perspective of CPL that is consolidated statement of profit or loss and also we'll discuss it from the perspective of consolidated statement of financial position so we're going to discuss this from the two perspectives so let's start first by discussing it from the perspective of consolidated statement of financial of profit or loss now when you are looking at it from consolidated statement of profit or loss the first thing that you need to consider is the value of the intra-group sales at selling price so how much is the intra-group sales at selling price so since we are told that Como kelly made intra-group sales of 960 to common life so kelly made intra-group sales of 960 to kelvin so that 960 is the total intra-group sales okay 960 is the total worth intra-group sales and also on this sales now the on the closing stock that is the unsold stock is 150 remember that unrealized profit is computed on the unsold stock so the unsold stock is 150 so it is on the closing stock of 150 that we are going to compute our unrealized profit on that is on the unsold inventory so the profit mark we are given a profit markup of 25 percent so for us to be able to calculate our unrealized profit that is going to be 25 over 125 times what 150 that's 25 over 125 times 150 so that's about 30,000 as our unrealized profit so in the cpl now you adjust this 960 from your sales adjust 960 from your sales so adjust 960 from your revenue so that's the first thing that you do you adjust 960 from your revenue then on the intra-group cost of sales now on the intra-group cost of sales now that's going to be 960,000 from revenue minus the unrealized profit of 30,000 so 960 minus 30 on the intra-group cost of sales on the intro so 960 minus 30 that's going to be 930 so that's what we're going to adjust from our intra group cost of sales so that's what you do in cpl now when it's come to the sofp the only thing you need to adjust for in sofp is the unrealized profit that is you debit your group your help and credit your inventory with the amount of the unrealized profit so that is what you do in your sofp note that the profit was made by the subsidiary so th therefore the unrealized profit will be apportioned between the group and nci so note that very well so that's, that's taking care of note three so note four is not that's taking care of note four so note five is also similar to note four so i need no shed no light on that also because it's talking about the same on the same intra group trading so the same principle that was discussed in note four is also applicable to note five so let's move on so that we can quickly discuss the other aspect of the of the paper now in note six now an impairment test conducted at year end did not reveal any impairment losses so that means there was no impairment loss so that's a good news so we just move on we skip that and move on all right so note se note seven now it is a group policy to value the non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition at fair value and the fair value of the non-controlling interest in kelvin at the first of january 2012 was 1.2 and also the fair value the nci in kelly was 1.8 so this is very straightforward so now so after now after you have finished treating all the adjustment okay step one like, let me recap again the step one is to stretch out your solution so which i used to refer to as a skeleton you do that first then the next step is to treat all the adjustments 
then after treating all the adjustment the last steps is to now i mean after treating all the adjustment then you can put your goodwill on acquisition so which is the next thing now you can put the goodwill on acquisition that is comparing your purchase consideration i mean your purchase consideration plus the fair value of nci then you list the net asset at the date of net asset of the subsidiaries at the date of acquisition that is your goodwill so that is how to cal calculate your goodwill so after computing the goodwill you also compute your reserves okay you compute your reserve then after computing the reserve you compute the non-controlling interest so once you are done with non-controlling interest you are good to go in consolidating the account okay so you are good to go in consolidating the world i can then another thing i need to mention before we proceed to the next question is that when you are solving a question on cpl that is on consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income always watch out for questions on acquisition during the year because that is very very common in ICANN now because the way you saw the way you consolidate subsidiaries under acquisition during the year is quite different from the way you consolidate subsidiary under full year acquisition so in this case now it is a full year acquisition because the company was acquired at least we have 12 month interval between the date of acquisition and the reporting date and in case the acquisition is less than 12 months then you are going to prorate the information of the subsidiary you are consolidating in your cpl okay you are going to prorate it and consolidate it in the cpl only so that is what you do under the under the statement or i mean that is what you do to take care of the first part of the question which is about 25 marks now the second part which i consider as the simplest says that we should distinguish between deferred consideration and contingent consideration so i'm just going to explain this i mean distinguish using one very very using two key points okay so those two key points are good are fine for distinguishing if i in this kind of question number one i would advise you to attend this same part first so that you can keep your five mark first then you now battle for the balance 25 what mark so the, my advice is please solve the c part of question number one first okay that should be the first thing you attempt all right should in case you have any question please feel free to post your question and we will be glad to answer your question live and direct all right so please can you feel free to post your question All right, so let's move on, please. So now, when you talk about deferred consideration, now, so deferred consideration is when you have agreed to pay a certain amount of the purchase consideration at an agreed future date. For example, let's assume you are acquiring a company for 10 million naira. You now agree that okay, you are going to pay 8 million now. Then the balance 2 million will be settled at, a, at an agreed date in the future. So under deferred consideration, there is no condition that it attached. The payment must be made when it is time to pay. So no condition is attached to deferred consideration. So you must pay the amount when it is the time to pay. But when we talk about contingent consideration, under contingent consideration, so here too, you've agreed to make a payment at an agreed future date under contingent consideration. You've agreed to make a payment. I mean, under contingent consideration, you've agreed, but that your, that your agreement is subject to certain conditions. So that means condition is usually attached to contingent consideration. So if those condition is fulfilled, then that your agreement can now be executed and if the conditions are not fulfilled then you can terminate it that is you can choose not to pay the purchase condition. so contingent depends on some certain criteria all right so that's number one so that means under the final condition is attached under contingent there are conditions attached to the payment then the second point is that your deferred con your deferred consideration okay deferred what consideration must be recognized at acquisition date at their present what value you recognize the first consideration at acquisition date at what present what value why contingent consideration will be recognized at acquisition date at what fair value so that's the difference so deferred is at present value why contingent it's at fair value so on that we can quickly move on to the next question now 
so we've done justice to the case study number one so let's discuss the case study number two quickly as we still have a lot of things to discuss on the exam tips then after the exam tips we continue solving questions till when our time will be up now case study two is talking about ratio so i'm going to skip all this information and go straight to the requirements all right so under the requirement now i said calculate each of this ratio for wale adria plc and its subsidiary so this is the word they are referring to for all wale adria plc's and its subsidiary we have to compute ratio so the first ratio is any per share that is what is due to shareholders based on the prevailing earnings so when you divide your earnings by your number of ordinary shares outstanding that is your any per shares okay that is your earnings which is also the same thing as your profit for the year divided by the number of ordinary shares outstanding that's your that's your any per share then dividend cover stocks about the number of times your current any will be able to set to your to pay dividend okay if your if your any is 10 million naira and your number of share and your dividend is what is 1 million that means you can afford to pay that dividend 10 times so that is what we call dividend cover the number of times your current any can settle your dividend note that your dividend cover is your earnings that is your profit for the year divided by the dividend okay and this is always in the in times that is your answer will be something times so that's for dividend cover then dividend yield also is another formula that is, is another ratio that we are required to calculate so that one is dividend cover so just div dividend you that is your eps divided by market price per share that's for dividend year so for alex says that which of the ifrs and ias do we so the question i'm reading a question from alex which is that which of the ifrs and ias do we focus on in november 2018 so i'm going to answer this one later on that is when we are discussing the exam tips okay so Dividend yield, we've taken care of that already. That is your dividend any per shares over dividend per share. All right, then the, I mean, that is any yield, sorry. Then the last one is, any yield is your any per shares over what? Market price per share, that is any yield. So why the twin brother of any yield is dividend per share? So your dividend per share is what? I mean, your dividend yield is your dividend per share over market price per share, so that's for this. Then the second one says that using the equity method, compute the earnings of the group incorporating the associates. So we need to now incorporate the what? The associate. They say we should compute the any for this group. So the current profit before tax is 427. Then that's 427. You will now have share of associate profit. Remember that the associate is 28%. So how many percent did we, it's 280 million, sorry. So how many percent did we own in this? associate that's 40 percent so just take 40 percent of 280 million so that's taking care of that so that is your associate's profit so you sum that up with your profit for the year then you aggregate the tax of the only the parent not adding it to the associate so with this now you can have your profit for the year so based on so the question that says that compute the ratios in a above for the group so that is Based on the information we now have now in B1 now, we have to now recompute this four ratio again. So the only thing that changes the new earnings that we have. So just you change your earnings and compute the same ratio all over again. So that's another form. So easily you can end your system max here. Easily. Okay, you can easily end your system max here. Now, the most important aspect of ratio analysis is on interpretation. So that's the most important aspect of ratio analysis. That's on interpretation. So in C part now, we are asked to comment on the ratio by pairwise word comparison. That is, we are going to compare the group with that of the word Wale Adura and its subsidiary. So your comment should not easily say that oh, this one is better. You need to for each of the ratio. We need to first of all give an advantage and disadvantage. And before you comment, just prepare a table and place both ratios side by side. So based on that, now you can pick your information and comment on them accordingly. All right. So that's for that. So I think that's for number two. Okay. We still have the deep part of number two, which is which is talking about the operation cycle. So that one also is very 
straightforward and direct okay so let's go through number three of the question now number three talks about ifrs5 non-current asset held for sales and its continuing operation set out the principle governing the measurement of so that the principle governing the measurement and presentation of non-current assets that are expected to be realized through sales rather than continue use. In fact, they've even defined the standard also in the in the in the equation they've defined it for us. So the standard also deal with reporting the result of operations that qualify as discontinued. Okay. Now require discuss the conditions which must be met for a non-current asset to be classified as held for sales and explain the accounting treatment that apply when such class a classification is deemed what appropriate so this is very very straightforward and direct so all we need to do basically is to list those conditions so just list like five conditions and you are home and dry once you after listing those five conditions then you explain the treatment of non-current asset and earth for sales so you can easily earn your sale marks here easily okay so one of so i'll quickly run through those conditions number one of them is on the is that the management is committed to plan the asset so there must be a management approval okay that the asset should be sold that's number one condition before you can classify an asset at first at else for sales then someone will say that there must be an active program to locate a buyer Okay, when the sales has been initiated, so there must be an active plan that is advertisement or whatever to look or publicity to locate what buyer. Okay, so and here come and here you are welcome online. So kindly simplify the look, kindly let us know the locations that you are reaching out from, the state you are reaching out from. Okay, now another condition is that the asset is must be marketed at a reasonable what price that is the price that is reasonable in relation to its fair value. Okay, then the action required to complete this plan sales will have been made and it is unlikely that the plan will be significantly changed or withdrawn. So just list these five conditions before an asset can be classified as held for sales and you are home and dry for this seven question. Now, so let's move on now. Still on question section number three. So, with the, so let's look at the three B. Now the three B is talking, we are giving a shot, okay. I mean, okay, before we discuss 3B, I need to explain the treatment of, okay, the treatment of non-current assets of health for sales now. So, the treatment is that the, any asset that is classified as held for sales must be presented separately on the face of the statement of financial position and included in the current, in current account. So, it will be the last item they are going to have under your current what? Assets, so it will come after your current asset as a separate line item. That is, once the asset is classified as held for sale. So, Michael from Le Michael or Maxi from Lagos, you are welcome. Then, Anika is listening to us from Aquaibon, you are also welcome. All right, so we've discussed that a part now. The B part is asking us to outline the condition which must be met in order to present the result. So we are giving a case study, a very short case study. Then we are asked to apply the condition that must be met in order to prevent the result of an operation as discontinued and the accounting treatment that apply when such a classification is deemed what necessary, is deemed is deemed what appropriate. That's the B A part now. So let me just go through the condition, then I will also explain the accounting treatment. So the condition says that the condition which must be met in order to meet to present the result of an operation as discontinued uh, that the discontinued operation number one of the condition is that it must represent a separate what major line of business or a geographical areas of what operation that's number one now then number two is part of a single coordinated plan to dispose of a separate major line of business or geographical areas of operation and lastly it is a subsidiary acquired exclusively with views to the sales so those are the three conditions that must be fulfilled before you can present the result of an operation as discontinued operation okay now the b part says that draft the, the i mean we, that we should also i mean still on the b1 
then we are asked to also explain the what the treatment the treatment now so the treatment is also very straightforward now so the total you on in the treatment you sum of the total hostess profit or loss for of the discontinued operation that is the profit or loss on the discontinued operation will be summed up together then the posters gain or loss recognized on the measurement at fair value less the cost of sales should be presented as a single amount in the statement of profit or loss so you also practicalize that for this simple case studies here which is for the eight marks so that will take care of your question number three so let's run through the question number four now okay question number four so let's go so we'll start this in less than a minute So we we'll discuss. We are going to discuss question number four. Oh, precious! You are too fast. So yes, I have to be fast so that we can cover as much as possible. And in case you have any question, you also have the power to drag me back to. Okay. So should in case you have any question, kindly pose the question. We have to be fast so that we can cover a lot of things within the short time frame that we have. Okay. So that's why we are just moving at this pace. So in case you have any question, kindly post it. We'll continue shortly. All right. Okay. So let's discuss the question number four also. We need to quickly wrap up the May 2018 question. Let's discuss the question number four. Now the question number four say that recording recording the substance of transaction rather than their legal form is an important principle in financial reporting. So the use of off statements of financial position arrangement enable companies to obtain financial without showing debt in their books. All right, so required now. So the requirement state that describe requirement describe describe the how the use of off statement of financial financing can mislead users of financial statement, making reference to their to three users group and giving uh, giving examples where when recording their legal form of transaction may mislead. Okay, uh, there is a question from Precious which says that I didn't get the conditions and treatment for 3B, sir. Okay, I didn't get the conditions and treatment for 3B. Okay, now in respect of the conditions, now I've just listed those conditions. Okay, all you need to do is just to list any five conditions so just list any of those five conditions so one of the conditions is that the asset must be readily available for sales and its immediate present condition so that's one of the conditions that the asset must be ready for sales its immediate present condition and the second one state that the management is committed to a plan to sell the asset that is you have the management approval then the third condition state that the asset is, is available for sales in its immediate present condition, which I've already explained. Then the next one state that an active program to locate a buyer has been initiated. That is, you've started sourcing for the buyers. Then another one state that the sales should be completed or expected to be completed within 12 months from the date of the classification. That is, you must complete your sales within 12 months. All right, so that's for that you must complete your sales within 12 months okay now let's continue with the other aspect now that we've at, we've answered precious question so the b part that you made mention of now i already explained the treatment in a part so all i needed you to do is just to apply the principle the treatment is says that you uh, once an asset is this is i mean has been classified as a discontinued operation 
then the asset must be separated from the other asset. That is, you have to disclose the asset, the after-tax profit or loss from the discontinued operation separately. So this will be recognized separately on the face of the statement of financial position, statement of profit or loss. So back to the question number four now. So the first requirement is talking about the substance over form principle. That is the principle of substance over form. All right, so that's what we have in the first requirement, the principle of substance over form. Okay, now what substance over form is talking about is that in accounting, we are much, much about the economic or commercial substance of a transaction rather than the legal form. So we are not after the legal form in accounting. We are much, much concerned about the economic or commercial substance of a transaction. So therefore, every organization should always record the economic sum of a transaction rather than the legal form. That was the principle of substance over form. Is talking about all right so that's what the principle of some of from then when we talk about off balance sheet of state of financial position of balance which is also referred to as a off balance sheet financing in the olden days now so this is when you are hiding key information from your financial position this is where you are hiding key information from your financial position all right you are hiding you are hiding key information from your financial position in the form of of what balance sheet event so that is what or that is what that one is talking about okay now so when you do that now there are some kind of implications that it has in your financial statement so we are asked to mention any okay we are asked to discuss that one also so the impact is that on the letter, they said that as Bibri explained the major accounting issues involving in the, okay, they said we should explain the impact, given, making reference to three users of account. So we can even do more than three, but let's limit ourselves to three based on the requirements of the examiner. So the first one says that not to lenders, lenders also they are one of the users. So the lender of capital is actually concerned about the entities Yearly position. So when borrowing is high, it's increased what risk. That means when you treat ransom as when you borrow money from someone instead of it to present it as a loan, you are treating it as off balance sheet what event. That is off statement of financial position what if event. So that will definitely mislead your lender because they are not aware that you have such information that you are hiding from them. Okay, that's one of them. Then to investors now. Investors now. So every investor that concerned with the entity profitability performance so that's just basically what everybody is all about so where borrowing is low it becomes inexpensive and tax efficient with promising return to the shareholders so every shareholders want dividend so whenever your honey is low it will affect your what dividend so when your borrowing is also low then your interest or finance costs, which you take as an expenses, will also be reduced. So this will definitely in turn have impact on your any. All right. So another one is um employees are also interested. That is employees. We are looking at it from employees' perspective. Employees are also interested in the finance statement because of their job security. So every start to want to know what is going with the company to know whether their job is secured or not. So that's for the employees. All right, so let's quickly move on now. So the B part is a case study. The B part of question number four is a case study. So let's go through the B part now, which is talking about it. So I'll just quickly explain what they want us to do under question number four B part. All right, so the questions goes just question number four now. So we're in four already. Okay, so I will also plan to wrap up this case study anywhere from now so that we can spend much time on the exam leave. So on page or paper, you are welcome online. Kindly indicate your location, that is location you are reaching out from. 
So question number four is all, there really is all about this continued operation. So we did not learn more emphasis on that. Let's go to the requirement. The first requirement says that briefly explain the major accounting issue in world transaction using the appropriate principle of what substance over form. So the first one is talking about factoring. That is the receivable was factored out. So there are about three cases here. This is talking about receivable. Then this is talking about building trio property. So let's talk about these things one by one and we'll move on to the other agenda of today. So the first one I'm going to talk about is um, factoring, receivables factoring. So when you factor receivable, you are engaging a third party to help you to take over the risk from you. So this is usually a method that most organizations use when it's in for safeguarding their receivables in the sense that you outsource the collection of your debt. Okay, that's what most companies use. So the issue is whether the trade receivable has been sold or the income from the finance house for their sales should be treated as a short-term loan. So that's major issues now. But what you need to after is who bear the risk when it comes to this avenue. That is, did whether the risk is transferred to the collecting agent or not. That is what you need to understand. So if the if the risk lie with the finance house, that is the collecting agent, then the trade receivable should be removed from the financial statement. Okay. I mean, if you have transferred the risk to the finance house, in this case now it is Ashe Jire, then you have to remove the receivables from your statement or financial position. So, because it is clear that, but in this, in this question now, it is obvious that the Wasimi, that is the person that holds the receivable, still bear the risk in, in relating to slow and long payment of receivable. So the payment by actually now depend that is the financial now depend on how quickly the receivable are collected. The longer it takes, the less the receivable was payment. So what you need to understand under factor is who bear the what the risk. So if the risk is transferred, then you have to, you need to also transfer your receivables to the other company. But if the risk is not transferred, then the receivable will be maintained in your books. So that's how you treat your receivables under factoring then the last one okay not the last one really so let's continue on b part on number four so we say that sales and lease back transaction so whenever there is a lease sales and lease back transaction the substance of it was that it was a loan that was collected by wasimi okay because as you are selling the item you are also losing it back so it's a loan so if not an asset cannot be sold and leased back immediately. It implies that the excess purchase position of 4 million, which is different between 24 million, which is the buy buy plus the 20 million that was used in transferring the asset, in substance is a loan rather than what sales proceed, which will be repaid through the excess of 1 million per month of the rent. So that excess you are paying is the interest on the loan. So this should be indicated that the lease is an operating lease, as the property should be treated as sold and what you recognize so that's just what you need to understand under suspects over form so let me permit me to quickly skip to question number five because i'm going to spend at least half an hour on the exam tips so that we can also be clear on what is what and what is required from us during the examination okay now question number five says that different tasks can be determined adopting to perspective that may result in different numbers in a financial statement and tax compensation so these are statement of compressive income and statement of finance position that is they are referring to the statement of profit or loss and statement of financial position so the requirement says that distinguish between the two perspectives of identifying different tax balances in the financial statement. So there are two perspectives. The first perspective is called income and expenses approach, which is the statement of profit or loss. So under this perspective now, you are comparing the difference between your accounting profit and your taxable profit. So here you are comparing the difference between the accounting profit a taxable profit so accounting profit is a profit that was computed in line with the accounting rules while taxable profit is a profit or loss that was computed in line with the 
tax rule. Okay, one is accounting rule, why the other one is tax. So when you compare your profit with each other, that is what we call income approach, which is your statement of profit or loss approach. Then the second one is your state is is known as the statement of financial position approach. That is SOFP. Statement of financial position approach. So when you are using statement of financial position approach, you are comparing the carrying amount with the you are comparing with the carrying amount with the tax base. That is, the carrying amount of your asset and liability is being compared with your tax base. That's what you do on that statement of financial position. So that's for that. Then this big part, basically, we have with soft similar questions is in our video. Kindly check for it. So this question is a, like a repeated question, even from the study pack. You have similar questions in your study pack. So kindly review the video lecture and go through this question. So it's exactly almost the same things we've solved it here. All right, so let's move on to the next question, which is question number six, okay? So let's discuss question number six. Let's discuss question number six now. So question number six says that Omotola PLC is a conglomerate which operates in different sectors of the economy. The company has many subsidiaries and associates across of the six continents of the world and as its head office is located in Lagos, okay, the share of the companies are listed on the Nigeria Stock Exchange. So the, the shares are listed on the Nigeria stock exchange now the company is trying to finance its finance to finalize financial statement for the year ended of april 20, 2018 and the following accounting issues are considered by the chief accountant based on the submission by the assistant accountant who is yes to complete his or professional examination with the icon the following and present the functional and presidential currency of motorless plc in era is naira and the, fin the following financial statement related to the company. The following financial transactions relate to the what company. So the first one states that on May 1, 2017, okay, on May 1, 2017, on May 1, 2017, Omotola PLC bought an investment property in US for $1 million. The company uses fair value model of IS40 to account for the investment property. Note that under IS40, you have the option of whether you want to use your cost model or evaluate or fair value model. So this company has chosen to use the fair value model. Okay, so I'm giving the fair value at 1.2. The assistance accountant is unsure which exchange rate to use, translating the investment property at the year end and how to recognize any exchange difference that may arise so this also we are going to discuss it so the most important one that is very straightforward is your exchange your exchange difference basically on translation of foreign subsidiaries account will be recognized to other comprehensive but income then in terms of the translation all assets and liabilities must be translated at the closing rate you translate all asset and liability at closing rate, then your share capital and your pre-acquisition result, you use your historical rate, that is the rate that was in existence when the shares of the subsidiaries was acquired. Then your post-acquisition result will represent the balancing figure. So that's what you do here in the A part of the question, okay? So we've talked about the foreign currency transactions and the gain or loss. So that has been discussed. Now the B part state that discuss how the transaction in one above will be accounted for in the financial statement of one other place for year ended. So as at the year ended now, then the Omotala will have to translate the investment property into a functional currency on purchase. So on purchase, it will be like that then. 
on the initial recognitions now you recognize the transaction at the spot trade then at the end of the year you have to retranslate using closing rates and any exchange difference arising from the investment property oh this is on investment property so that means all our exchange difference goes to P or L, not OCIO like I said earlier on OCI is when you are retranslating the subsidiary so you now have exchange gain or loss so that can be recognized in OCI, both the one of a single entity transactions you recognize your exchange difference to profit or loss. Okay, so that's for that. Now let's look at the C part. Discuss how the transaction in two above will be accounted for in the financial statement of Omotola for the year in accordance with IS21. So I guess this is similar to. The one we just stopped now. Okay, so to avoid wasting time, let's move on now. I think to the last question now, question number seven. So please, in case you have question, kindly post your question and we'll be glad to answer your question. Okay. So we just go on a short, very short recess for like maybe 30 seconds before we discuss the question number seven. Okay, so let's continue. Let's go through the question number seven, which is the last question for May 2018. Then we'll discuss our exam tips. we we'll share like 30 minutes. So once we are done with the exam tips, we we'll go back to the past question. So the next we'll be discussing after that is November 2017. So let's go through these questions now. Some shareholders in Nigeria are becoming increasingly interested in the environmental policy and impact and practice of business entity, giving the advice of some oil and gas and telecommunication company. However, financial statements have not traditionally provided, provided this information. However, financial statements have not provided this information. As a result, there is early indication that some listed entities in Nigeria are beginning to publish sustainability report report comply complying with the global reporting initiative gri in organization set up in 1997 to develop a sustainability reporting framework for business so gri sustainability reporting guidelines give guidelines to entity on how to measure and report on management approach to the business to the economic environment and social aspects that impact on the award businesses so require identify require identified and explain principal argument against voluntary disclosure by business entity of their environmental policy impact and what assessment so this is like a free for all questions whoever you have the right to express yourself so you are told to identify and explain so that means don't you can do like a minimum of five points okay minimum of what five points is okay for this just do a minimum of five points and you move on from there all right so in case you have question kindly post and we will attend to the question so many people are online following the lectures but no one has questions so far all right, so here we are discussing on the importance of the voluntary disclosure, which one of them is the environmental report. So environmental report are report that give details of the entity activity and its impact on the world environment. So that report gives details of your activities and the impact your activity have on your what environment. So that is what we call environmental report. That is the environment that you operate. So the following are some of the arguments against voluntary what disclosure. So we are, that is more or less like a disadvantage of voluntary disclosure based on the argument. So it's a free for all. Like I said earlier on, you can just select the first six points of your own, and that will be all. So number one of those argument against is that voluntary disclosure are of limited usefulness as they are not readily comparable with other reporting entities because the reporting entity might choose not to disclose it because of comparability. So it's very difficult, except you have a company in the same industry with you. 
they have disclosed such report that you can compare if whether you have in the information you have disclosed is factual or probably it's just based on your own experience with the environment then the second point says that voluntary information may not be audited and therefore the reliability of information is questionable and make it less useful to decision makers so no one audit your voluntary whatever because it's not part of the compulsory disclosure so you can as well deceive the shareholders if you choose to through the voluntary disclosure so any cost incurred will reduce profit as subsequent potential returns to shareholders so that is also very that is also one of them then voluntary disclosure are part of annual report which imply that there is a risk of information overload where this occur the relevance and usefulness of the information is reduced so you you, you will want to definitely everybody want to avoid information overload which might even have a detrimental impact on the organization when people have too much information about you then it's very very dangerous okay so since voluntary disclosure are not regulated by laws disclosure tends to lack standardization so this is another argument against voluntary disclosure okay then information overload in voluntary disclosure may lead to window dressing also so because since it's not been audited or there is no standard that made it compulsory so possibility for it to have information overload is very possible which may also be what misleading okay so that is voluntary disclosure all right so let's take a look at the next part which is the last part of this question explain the nature of the information that could be disclosed by entity in their external report in respect of the environmental and social aspects in order to comply with the GRI administrator. So, sample of the information that may be disclosed is what they are asking for here. So, one of them is your environmental impact assessment is very, very important. So, you need to also what? disclose that. Then, your target on waste, emission, and pollution are likely to be set, and strategy for achieving this and performance to date could also be what? included and anything may also include its policy regarding local and global economic and disclose target and its performance to date then a lot of points there so just mention few of them like five you work more on those five and you move on okay so that is what they are asking for their on voluntary disclosure so uh, we're going to pause now from the past question let's spend the next 30 minutes or there about on our exam tips then if we have time after exam tips we can come back and discuss the may 2017 okay before we run out of time now my exam tips here yeah, i've just basically this was compiled based on my personal uh, experience with icon so i've done that based i've done all these exam tips based on personal experience okay at least experience over time with what i can so i will advise every one of us to please hold our pen and take note of this point one after the other because i can also is not just about many billion students exceptional students feel that i can because they lack this principle that i'm going to explain now so i can exam is not the kind of exam whether you're going to the exam hall to flex your muscle you need to be very very tactical with how you approach your exam it is very very important so before the exam now which is today for example now before the exam is now because the exam is going to take place in about 15 or 16 days there about so before the exam which is now what do you need to do now what do you what you need to do the first thing you need to do is basically you need to have an in-depth coverage of the syllabus don't say that oh this one will not come out or this one came out last diet and they're not going to test it. Please have, I need to advise people, if you know you can't be expert in everything, just have above average knowledge. So that even if you are able to apply that you above average, above average knowledge in the exam, that might even fetch your pass mark. So, but that you will say that, oh, this one, I'm not going to read it. It won't come out that they've not been testing it or it came out last diet. Never do that. So the first point state that have an in-depth coverage of the syllabus so that's the first step have an in-depth coverage of the syllabus then the next step says that 
accept all the questions in the study part, there is likelihood that some questions might be what? Repeated. You need to attempt all the questions in the study part because there is likelihood that some questions might be repeated. So this is very, very... So what you will just do is this. Just go through your study pack. All questions, every topic have little, little questions. So please quickly attempt those little, little questions. It is very, very important, okay? So every topic have some questions. Make sure you glance through those questions. In fact, there are, there are some that in the course of your study, you must have able to solve them. But please, make sure you glance through all those questions in your study pack. It's very, very important. So that you can do now. So that is because before the exam. So attempt all questions in study pack. There is likelihood that some questions might be repeated. So that's the next point that you cannot under estimate then the third point is that attempt all the questions in the pint finder starting from november 2014 to may 2018 don't joke with any questions these are the exposure i'm giving you there is likelihood that one or more of those questions may be repeated this diet so please from november 2014 to may 2018 ensure you practice those questions because your exam will not be materially different from all these questions that they have been asking you from that diet to date. So please, practicing question is very, very important. All right, so having discussed this one down there, keep solving questions to the last moment. Keep solving what? Questions to the last moment. After all, your exam is about providing solutions to what? Questions. From experience, I have some students that they don't even practice question at all. It is only what they learned in the class that they will just go home and drum, dump their bag. They've never sat down to practice. And meanwhile, in the class, they are very, very active. So because they don't solve questions now, they are not used to it. So in the exam now, something that you have not been doing before, if you now want to start in the, in the exam, or there is likelihood that you won't get used to it, so which might affect you. So please. The only way you can master the heart of solving questions is starting from now, okay? Solve as many questions as you can lay your hands on. Even if it is one that you've solved before, you can resolve again. So luckily, that might even be the word they will repeat in the exam, okay? So please, solve as many questions as what possible. Then in case you have any case study or question that you couldn't solve properly, just glance through the solution, okay? Before you glance through the solution, first of all, ask us for help, okay? After asking us for help and you are still confused, okay, what you will do then is to glance through the word solution and try to understand how the examiner solved the word questions. Because if they, in case they repeat that same question, you are going to adopt the same approach that was adopted by the examiner. So that's what I mean by that. So that's what you do before the exam okay before the exam now the next one is on the exam so the, uh, we are clear on what and what we need to do before the exam now okay so let's discuss what and what we need to do on the exam date on the exam day so all our preparation for the last three months or so now exam date is the most important date that we must not underestimate okay that is the most important date that we must not what underestimate so the first thing is that on the exam date please try and wake up early in the morning okay please try and wake up early in the morning that's number one thing wake up early what in the morning so it is not advisable to have an overnight study so a lot of people if you keep having accumulated overnight study up to exam days, you might just crash or you won't be able to have or your body or your immune system will be so weak. So I will advise you to please not to bother yourself much on the exam day overnight so that you wake up early. Okay. After waking up early, have a light breakfast. So on exam date is not a day for you to have every breakfast. Just have a very, very light breakfast something that can sustain you at least for throughout the exam period have a light breakfast because your brain needs to be free and you also need to be free you need to have open mind so don't overclock yourself with food that 
will make you heavier than necessary okay that's what you need to do then make sure you get to the exam venue at least one hour prior to the commencement of the paper okay and anthony firma from lagos you are welcome also so we've just we've concluded may 2018 past questions review so now we are currently on the exam tips okay so we are currently on exam tips now you are welcome on board so get to the exam hall at least one hour before the commencement of the paper this is very very important so this will make you to relax very well okay you relax very well also i normally advise people when you are going for the exam please go with water okay you drink as much as water as possible you can even go in with what but the examiner cannot question you to drop your water okay you can go in with butter but water but not an alcoholic drink of water you can go to the exam hall with water make sure you are relaxed your mind is free from anything okay then also you if you are in the exam or let's say earlier than first like let's say even an hour or so you can still spend some time to recap your key points let's say you have jotted down some points so you can do a quick recap before the exam or don't spend the money just with or greeting with people greeting with people is fine after greeting phase is what you are doing you can do all the blunt all the greetings after the exams okay so you spend some time also to do a recap because you have objective and your, your objective is to pass your paper that is all that's your number one objective all other objectives are secondary so your main objective is what passing that paper so do a quick, quick recap of the exam hall then when they ask you to come to enter the exam hall please drop all exhibit that you have with you such as your jotter if you have jotted down something in the paper just destroy it you can't take it to the exam hall even if you forget to, dis to destroy and you are caught definitely you will be penalized nobody will listen to you all that oh you forgot to, to drop it so rather Make sure you search yourself before you enter the exam hall for in case there won't be any you don't have any exhibit or if you have one destroy. So example of what you need to drop outside or what you won't be allowed to go in, in with the exam or sh and should the examiner not find out in the exam hall you are in big trouble. So please avoid going in with those kind of materials such as your phones. Your phones must be outside, not on switch off inside. You must drop your phone totally completely outside the exam hall your jotters your textbook your study packs everything that is written material you drop it outside so the only thing that you are allowed to go in to the exam hall your written materials like your pen pencil eraser ruler calculator then some courses require you to come with your four figure table okay so you can ask the examiner if it is allowed for that paper or not so some exams definitely will allow you to go in with the four figure table, such as your SFMs or code. But please, you can still do a second check if that is still applicable. Okay, and any four figure table that you are going with, ensure that it is a new one, new four figure table. Don't go with something that has some workings written and written on it is a crime too. That's like you are going to face the panel straight away if you are caught with that. So make sure your four figure table is new. At least you are sure that nothing is written inside that is a new material you have just bought that's for that then ensure that you're not with your cell phone i've discussed this then make sure you have a functioning wristwatch i'm going to shed more light on wristwatch later on now now so that is what you need to do so on the exam day do a checklist of all these things and take yourself pass 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 so that's for the exam that's on the exam day now the most important time ever that is during the exam hall you have just three hours to spend in the exam hall that's three hours for your study three hours for the exam itself then you have about 15 minutes or there about for your queue for your reading okay now so i'm going to limit it to three hours so excluding the one that is meant for reading i'm going to limit this to three hours so three hours only now 
so as you enter the example the first thing that you need to do is to locate your what your seat okay locate your golden seat locate your seat and sit you can locate your seat by tracing it with the number of your docket your docket have a seat number so based on that now the number are written in your seat so locate it and sit quietly okay then have a quick prayer immediately the question are served because once you are seated like this they will serve the question and they will ask you to turn the question upside down that is do not open it until you are told to do so so as you receive your question please have a quick prayer you don't pray when the call starts because after the start your three hours you start counting immediately you have served your question prayer question question paper i will advise you to do your quick prayer as you have served your question because you'll be looking at the question but you can't open until you are told to do so so while you have the questions with you you can start your prayer then once as the exam now commence because they are going to call start they are going to ask you to start immediately at once so once your exam commence now please listen to this very very important strategy because most brilliant students feel like can and they don't know how they feel why they fail even i've taught some students that i never imagined they could fail and some of them maybe fail and the people that you least expect to make it they are the one that make it they will now come back and share how they did it so the same principle that can assist you in passing your exam easily those are the principles that i'm going to discuss with you now remember that i'm going to work on three hours i won't, i'm not going to assume that you have any 15 minutes extra which is a good news for you also so your papers are divided into three sections we have section a we have section b and we have section c those are the three sections that we have we have section a section b and section what c now for this section here now that's number one compulsory question so i'm going to tell you the secret behind section a shortly your so section a is number one compulsory question then section b so the maximum mark that you can derive from section a is 30 marks okay what you can get from section a as your maximum marks is what is 30 marks then from section b in section b now the max you, you have three questions in section b and you are asked to answer any two of your choice and each question goes for 20 marks that means the maximum mark you can get for section b is 40 marks okay that's section b 40 what max that's the maximum mark that you can get from section b then section c also you have three questions and you are told to ask you will have to answer only two and each of the questions after i mean carry 15 minutes so 15 marks so that means the maximum you can get from section c is 30 marks so total everything you have your 100 in marks now the approach is this the three hours allocated to you please you also need to do your own internal allocation that means your section hey don't spend more than 45 minutes on your section a don't exit 45 minutes on it section b don't spend more than an hour on section b remember that you are going to attempt to that means you have 30 minutes per question in section b don't exit one hour in section b then section c also don't exit one hour you have three also where you are you will be asked to attempt to so if you total this thing together you have about two hours 45 minutes then the remaining minutes that is now left is what you can now use to do your mop-up or revision of what you have written whether there is need for correction or you have an additional point to write then the way they ask you to start please don't ever start with section hey that's going to consume your time and it might discourage you okay section a questions are not always straightforward like that most 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 likely on corporate reporting group account is going to be your section a so some of them are not always direct and simple because your confidence will increase only when you start with the smallest question so as it's, you start with the simplest word question that is how to boost your confidence so please i will advise you the way they ask you to start go to section b start with section b first okay start with what section b first then followed by section c and follow your section a should be the last that means the first two hours now you are going to spend it on section b and c the first two hours you are going to spend it on section b and c then you spend the last 
one hour which 45 minutes is what you need for section a now remember always ensure you attempt you know overall you have to attempt five rule one from section a which is compulsory two from section b do not go beyond two in section b no matter how the simple those questions are two from section b and two from section c never go beyond two questions from section c okay always follow the examiner's instruction so when you receive your paper like this go straight to your section b so mr bubaka is my a from ub you are welcome on board all right so the more you receive your question please go straight to section what section b out of the three questions in section b quickly identify the best two of your choice okay the two questions that you are very very comfortable with out of the three you must select two maximum then i would normally i normally advise students when you see a theory and calculation and you are good with the theory so please quickly answer those theory and ignore the calculation because theory if you know as long as you know your key points then you can hang your mark in theory and also that will save you time in battling with what calculation so theory if you know it please do give preference to it than calculation if you know the theory because it will save your time number one then also if you know what you are writing it will boost your confidence so then apart from theory or not in on each section always start from the with easiest question don't start with a tough question that will discourage you or spoil your mood for the next three hours or please start with the simplest word question start with the simplest word question that is very very important so having said all this now you are not expected as for my principle to go beyond two hours 45 what minutes okay in attempting all the five questions note that you can't say that of five you are going to attempt only three you must attempt all the five because you don't know which question will give you one or two marks that can cross your 50 to 51 or cross your 49 to 50 or from 48 to 50 you must attempt all the questions okay that is very very important you must attempt all the questions then start with the simplest question in each section that will boost your confidence going forward i've already talked about this then ensure you attempt the compulsory question as the last question this is very very important and also never submit or never think you are done until when you attempt your compulsory because i understand that if you don't attempt the compulsory question at all there is highly likely that you are going to re repeat that paper because you didn't follow the instruction the instruction said that the question number one is what compulsory that means everybody must touch it if it is group if it's always collecting you can drop and do some things on the percentage of shareholding that is fine so please you must ensure you attempt your section what section i mean you attempt your section a is very very important okay that's very very important always attempt your quest so compulsory question then before you start fresh question on a fresh page don't clump your solutions together start a fresh question on a fresh word page but ensure that the question number is written at the top of the answer sheet okay the answer sheet will clearly mention where you are expected to write the question number so ensure that your question number is written at the top of your what answer script that is very very important your question number must be written at the top of your what answer script so that will also assist the examiner in tracing and marking your script okay in tracing and marking your script for convenience sake so that is also very very important then make sure you attempt all the five questions following the above timing principle i've already explained how you can easily attempt all the five questions just follow the simple time management techniques discussed then you can easily attempt all the five questions but remember to always start from the easiest what questions don't start with a tough question that will discourage you or that will demoralize or reduce your confidence level always start from the simplest question then if you are once you are done solving all the questions don't join those guys that they will just close your book and sleep waiting for the examiners to 
ask them to, want to call, stop, and submit. And never rush to submit your script. Please enjoy you use your three and a half hours or whichever time that is provided. Ensure you utilize your time fully. It is your money. So as, as an accountant, prudence is one of our store where we try to get value for what money. Make sure you get value for money by remaining in the exam or up to the last minute when the call pen up. Because you don't know which point you might need to write. Some people, they will just rush and submit. When they now submit, they now remember, oh, this point, I should have added it. So once you leave that hall, you can never go back and add your points. You know, it is final. So please, don't always rush to leave your exam hall. Remember that one mark can change your 49 to 50. 49 is failed and 50 is passed. So when you have that at the back of your mind, please ensure you utilize all necessary weapons to ensure to make sure that you are going to cross that max okay that's just the worst case scenario all right so please take note of that then spend the last 15 minutes to review your solution after that then stop writing really the examiner told you to do so this is very very important some examiner can just if they if you disobey them or you are they, you are caught speaking with somebody you can just write minus 10 on your script and sign meaning that any score that you have you will be penalized with 10 marks so never allow these things to happen to you seeing that alone will discourage you totally okay imagine somebody writing minus 10 from your mark because you have disobeyed one principle or the other so if they ask you to stop writing please immediately stop writing and move on please okay so uh febe or sato ikechuku the only way you can have this video is share this video on your wall on your facebook page then you can always go back and read and go through it again then baba tunde bisri you are welcome on board just indicate the location you are reaching us from so i've discussed all the exam tips that i feel that are necessary that is during before before during and on the exam date then lastly after the exam date if you are writing all the four papers the moment you are done with copy reporting please stop talking about copy reporting and phase the next paper don't that after the paper when you know you are done with your first paper and you have another paper in the next two hours, that is not the time for you to now start going through your book to see whether you have done well in CR. Whether you like it or not, once you have something your script, if everything is closed. So if you have done well or not, you can go back and collect that you want to amend something. Just forget about it. Don't let one paper spoil the other papers for you. When you are done with it, just forget about anything about CR. After the exam, you can do your self-assessment. Face the next paper immediately. Don't make that kind of mistake. And, and never discuss with any student outside that, oh, you should have done it. Well, you guys have paper in the next less than an hour or two. So please, once you're done with the paper, please forget about that paper. Move on to the next paper immediately. Don't discuss with anybody. You don't have time for that. Okay? So that's number one. Then also, you need to also pray to support it, to support your script. Okay? Pray. Then after prayer also, start preparing for the next diet. Okay, for those of you at the final, that means start preparing for your inductions or whatever. I think that's just it. That's what you need to know about the exam step. So, best of luck to every one of you in advance. So, I think we still have like 10 minutes to go. We still have like 10 minutes to go. Okay. So, I'm going to spend the last 10 minutes to quickly discuss the case study number 1, November 2017. Then, after that, we call it a day. So let's discuss case study number one, November 2017. At least let's use the last 10 minutes to discuss this case study. Case study number one, November 2017. Remember that we've already discussed May 2018, okay? So let's discuss number one of November 2017 before we wrap up the class. Now, the questions goes thus out with your pint finders. Please bring out your pen finals if you have one with you. Just quickly go to the November, number one of November 2017. So let's go through the question quickly. The following are the final statements of Papa, Tata, and Chebe, all PLCs, as at 31st of March 2017. Okay, 31st of March 2017. As at 31st of March 20, what? 17. Okay. That's what we have there. Okay, the first of March 2017. Okay, we're giving the, the statement of financial position. Now, so we're also giving some information about the how the shares were acquired. Tata have some 30 and 60 percent in the company like this. Okay, you also provided with the following information. 
which will be relevant to the consolidated statement of financial or state of or state, statement of proper PLC. None of the companies has issued any additional share capital since first of what April. Okay, now 2014. Okay, the financial statement of Papa have not yet been adjusted for the gain or loss arising on for the gain or loss for the gain or loss arising on gaining control of what of Papa on 1st of April. The carrying amount of the net asset of Tata was the same was the same as their fair value of 325. I want to read all four then before analyzing and solving the question. So note four says that proper PLC, which is to use fair full fair value method of accounting for the acquisition of Tata, and after at first of April 2016, the estimated fair value of goodwill attributable to NCI was 30 million. The estimated fair value of in the initial 30% of Tata was 150 million at the 1st of March 2013. Included in the tangible non-current asset of Tata is land valued at cost on March 31st, 2017 the of the current amount. There had been no subsequent significant change in that value. Then at 1st April 2016, the fair value of Chevy's land was 16 million liters of its current amount. There had been no subsequent change, soft, I mean subsequent change, significant change in that value. The goodwill arising acquisition is tested for impairment at each year end at 31st of March and impairment loss of 50 million was recognized for Tata. So that's the questions we have that we need to solve now. Okay, so if you check this question now, this question is on piecemeal, piecemeal, okay, it's on piecemeal acquisition. So this question is on piecemeal what acquisition is on piecemeal acquisition so whenever you have piecemeal acquisition it's very very straightforward now so all you need to do is to determine the what the how the shares was acquired now if you check these questions now on 1st of april 2014 okay papa acquired 30 percent of tata so that is the first acquisition okay 30% of the first acquisition and this 30 when we acquired 30 percent the fair value of the net asset was 325 and this 30% was acquired for 120 million so that's the first acquisition then the second acquisition was on 1st April 2016 whereby Tata acquired what 50 percent okay Tata acquired 50 percent I mean Papa acquired 50 percent in Tata and this fair value was 460 and the purchase constitution was 260 so these are the acquisitions now so the first thing is to do is to calculate the first thing is to do here is to first of all determine the goodwill on what acquisitions or okay you determine the what the goodwill on what acquisition so after determining the good on acquisition then you cannot prepare your retain any reserve and other key information that was acquired but if you check very well now the initial acquisition was an associate okay the initial acquisition was 30 percent associate and when we acquired another 50 percent now we lost the control of the what the associate the control of associate was lost so you must calculate the profit or loss on the recognition of what associate because the status changed on 1st of april 2016 from associate to subsidiary initially when we had 30 percent the company was known as an associate then when the 30 percent now changed to 60 percent then it's no longer an associate it is now a subsidiary so in this case now how do we calculate the profit or loss on the recognition of associate? So this associate, on the date it was recognized, what is the fair value of the 30% investment? We were given that the fair value was, I think it was 150. We were given somewhere within this note that the fair value on that date was 150 million. So let me quickly locate the note somewhere. Okay, okay, the fair value of the initial investment was 150 million. So you take the 150 million 
that is the fair value of the investment that was transferred to the subsidiaries from what associate then what is the initial cost the initial cost was 120 million yeah, this investment was bought for 120 million then this was for 20 million is as on 1st of april 2014 so you need to also value value the because investment in associate is to be recognized at cost plus share of associate post acquisition profit that is using the equity method of what accounting so how do we get the share of associate post acquisition profit all we need to do is to determine the current profit as per the account the current profit of associate as per the account was how much the current reserve was 210 but we can't use 210 because 210 was given as at first of what april 2016 so and the reporting date is 31st of march 2017 we need to determine the profit as on as on text as on first of april 2016 which is like a year before so it is that profit that we need that will help us in determining the profit of associate at the beginning of the what the year so if we we'll arrive at that profit of associate just take that 210 okay 210 less the adjustments so that means we need to first of all adjust for the retail any of the of the tata itself before we can be able to arrive at the profit okay so you need to walk back to get that profit so if you walk back that is adjusting it with all the necessary information that we are giving in note one note two and note three so the profit should be it should be around 175 then you less your pre-acquisition reserve from it so pre-acquisition reserve is a reserve that exists at the date of what acquisition so any reserve that exists at the date of acquisition is your pre-acquisition what reserve so once you adjust your pre-acquisition reserve from it then take 30 percent which is your associate share of that profit so with that now you'll be able to arrive at your get profit or loss on the recognition of what associate so now that the asset has been recognized now the investment is no longer an investment in associate it is now an investment in subsidiaries it is now an investment in what subsidiaries then for the other information given to us too let's look at them properly so that we can be able to advice okay included in the tangible non-current asset of tata is land valued at cost which on 31st of march 2017 had a fair value of 25 million in excess of its carrying what amount in excess of its carrying value there has been no subsequent significant change in that value so this was also given so in this case now since it occurred at the date of what acquisition it okay it occurred on 31st of march 2017 so it occurred at the end of the year at the end of the year so the entries for this to debit our ppe and credit the net asset was acquired so you debit the ppe and credit the net asset was acquired then on note six now at 1st of april 2016 the fair value of she land was 16 million okay the fair value of Shebase land was 16 million in excess of its current amount so this occurred on 1st of april remember that the 1st of april is the date of what acquisition so the fair value was 16 million above that and there has been no subsequent changes in that value okay there will be no subsequent change in that what value so this also you are going to debit your ppe and credit the net asset debit the ppe and credit the net asset what acquired with this so that's what is required here because this occurred at the date of what acquisition all right so this is clear then goodwill arising on acquisition is tested for impairment at each year end and at the first of march an impairment loss of 15 million was recognized for tata so the impairment loss was 15 million remember that this impairment loss since we are using fair value or full goodwill method so the impairment loss will be borne by both the group and nc high so the impairment loss will be borne by both the group and what nc high so that is how you account for impairment when you are using your full goodwill or fair value method okay so that's for that okay so that is for that then also let's discuss one more point then 
we just wrap up from there so the next part i'm going to discuss here is the paper which is to use the few v value method of accounting for the acquisition of tata and at first of February 2016, the total value of goodwill attributable to nc high was 3 million so we have been given the goodwill attributable to nci which was was 3 million so this needs to be grossed up so that we can determine the total goodwill itself so to, the estimated value of initial investment that was 150 million so this one that was given to us is for the nci we can always gross it up to determine the total goodwill okay so that also is what is required there so this is this question basically is on piecemeal acquisition because the acquisition was acquired in stages so it's on piecemeal acquisition so with what we've discussed now we can easily consolidate the questions and think that will be all about the question so i've been discussed a lot of principles as far as the icon exam is concerned so all i'm all you need to do is just to try and listen to this video as long as i mean you can listen to it again through your facebook page and in case you have any question you can always connect with us through our whatsapp group okay so that should be all for this diet so on behalf of the menu of Tari Goat, so it's my pleasure being with you all for the whole of this diet and also wishing you the very best of luck in your exams okay so see you guys at the top and have a nice